Hello, uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome back to day two of Engage 2021. Um, so we, we are here for the session on startup accelerators. Are they right for your venture? Um, so my name is Tony Williams, and I work at Princeton University as New Ventures Associates in the Office of Technology Licensing. Um, so essentially, my role is to support uh, Princeton researchers who are looking to turn their inventions and their research uh, into, into startup companies and, uh, as a way of taking them from lab to market. And one of the sort of most important, most impactful ways that we found uh, to, to start and grow um, our startup companies is for them to join accelerators to get the um, mentorship, uh, the support uh, they need in order to, to build a great venture. And we're really lucky today to, to be joined by, um, by four um, of our sort of partner organizations, for very different uh, accelerator programs, um, which uh, which many many of our startups have have worked with, as, as a way to, to move themselves closer to market. Um, so, uh, in terms of the session today, I, I'm going to ask. Uh, in turn, I'm going to bring up each of our our four accelerator partners uh, to to introduce themselves very briefly and give a very uh, quick two minute overview of, of their programs. And then the rest of the session, we're going to dig into some some Q and A uh, and, um, and and dig deeper into into you know how exactly their programs operate, um, these eligibility, the, um, uh, the application process, um, and, and how they can help a startup move forward. Um, so, so we have a ton of questions, but we also would love to hear from you, um, the audience as well. Um, so uh, if you have any questions you would like to ask the panel, um, please don't hesitate to, to put those into the, into the live Q&A, um, and we will try and get to them uh, during the session. So, um, without further ado, um, I'm going to sort of introduce uh, the, the first of our of our Accelerator programs that are joining us today. Um, so, so please, this is Sharon Ross, uh, who is the program director of QED at the University City Center Science Center um, in Philadelphia. Good morning, Good morning. Thank you, Tony. That's a lovely introduction, um, and it's a pleasure for me to be here um, to talk about the QED program. And first, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the uh, Science Center itself. That uh, uh, where the where the QED program resides, we are located in University City, which is uh, on Market Street, 36 and Market Street in Philadelphia. We're very adjacent to the campuses of Penn and Drexel, and uh, also just right down the road from the 30th Street train station. So, just to give you an idea of where we're located, and um, the QED program to talk about it. So, the Science Center's been instrumental in doing uh, convening. Um, entrepreneurs and uh, for a very long time, we're at one of the oldest research, urban research parks. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, and uh, since 2009, the Science Center has been uh, hosting the QED program, which is a, a, a unique program in that it's a regional multi-institutional program. And it takes an approach to uh, sciences from our 22 participating research institutions to uh, uh, help commercialize the most promising technologies. Um, and uh, with that, we um, it's a, it is a comp competitive program. And uh, each year we look at uh, applications from those programs uh, that are given to us through, this, through their uh, technology transfer office and uh, pick the 12 usually for each cohort uh, to receive further um, benefits as in um, um, a product, um, um, and advisors <laughs> and specialists like in, in, in IP and regulatory and uh, reimbursement, sometimes toxicology, sometimes manufacturing, whatever those specialists may need, all in preparation of writing what QED is known for, which is their proof of concept uh, plan. And that's a roadmap for them to move forward. So uh, at the end of the year, uh, a company is awarded and they receive up to $200,000 uh, as an award to then prove out the proof of concept plan that they have been developing with the help of their uh, academic advisors uh, in the next year. So um, right now we're looking at the very final uh, presentations for this round of our, of our cohort. And um, um, 
so we're we're hoping to make that award. Um, and that two hundred thousand dollars, just as an award, is a hundred thousand dollars from the science center and it's a cash contribution, and a hundred thousand dollars as a um, in kind contribution from the participating institution. So um, I'll take it to Tony. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, uh, could I next ask, uh, please, uh, Christina Tamer to uh, introduce a little bit to VentureWells Accelerator Program. Good morning. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thanks for having me today. VentureWells thrilled to be a partner of Princeton University and happy to be here at the session this morning. Uh, so as Tony mentioned, I'm with VentureWell. And VentureWell, you may have heard of us if you know the National Science Foundation i program or perhaps the National Institutes of Health, the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics program. So VentureWell has been around for 25 years, doing a lot of different work with higher education institutions, government agencies. Um, but I'm not here to talk about those today. I'm here to talk about a small but mighty program called the E-Team program that's been around in some way, shape or form for the last 25 years. It really has been what spurred a lot of VentureWell's work. The E-Team program got started, as I mentioned, 25 years ago with support from the Lemelson Foundation. The Lemelson Foundation was founded um, out of support from Jerome Lemelson, who is a prolific inventor, over 500 patents to his name. And that's sort of been the, the seeding and the grounding of our mission ever since. So we work with early stage uh, innovators, inventors, and entrepreneurs. And in this program, we offer multiple stages of training. So it actually operates a lot like a funnel. Uh, so we're working with anywhere from 50 to 60 uh, teams at the first stage um, in a given year. Uh, they, they funnel down about half of those to the next stage, and then a portion of those go on to the last stage, the third stage. And within those stages, you know, we're helping primarily student innovators really explore the journey of what it means to even become an entrepreneur. What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? What do you need for the foundational support around uh, intellectual property? Do you need to license it from your university? How are you organizing your founding team? What financing and resources are available to you? In addition to all of the core work around customer discovery, understanding product market fit, and understanding how to build and validate a business model. Um, we also offer our, our last stage of training is all about preparing for your first seed round of investment, really working side by side with investors to stress test your, your, your investment proposition, basically. Um, so not just the pitch deck, but the, the due diligence deal room and everything that goes into that. So we offer, as I said, a stage gated process, and we end up working with, with teams and, and entrepreneurs uh, for over the course of a couple of years as they go at their own pace through this staged uh, training process. We also offer non-dilutive funding, so uh, staged grants. They can start out with $5,000, go on to $20,000. And then if an entrepreneur or a startup completes all three stages of our programming, we have the ability to make an investment uh, in those companies. So today we've made investments in 26 alumni startups coming out of our program. Uh, I think that's a good high-level summary. We can get into more details in the Q&A. Thanks, Tony. Many, many thanks, Christina. Um, so, so next, I'd like to in invite Ben Solomon, who's the founder and managing partner of FedTech. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Christina. Nice to uh, uh, venture all those amazing work and pleasure to be on this panel. So, uh, yeah, Ben Solomon here. I'm the founder and managing partner of FedTech. Uh, we are uh, an accelerator that, you know, we fashion, we kind of live between two worlds that don't often talk well uh, to each other. So the venture world and then the world of uh, government funded R&D. Um, and I, I'm a proud uh, 06 Princeton alum. I was joking to Tony earlier that uh, unfortunately COVID sort of robbed me of, of my big reunion, but excited to get back and, and just uh, love Princeton uh, to death and really a pleasure to be here. So uh, a little bit more just about us. So I think people will sometimes lose sight of that, you know, US government is really the biggest R&D investor, you know, in the history of the world. So if you use an iPhone, you know, on a daily basis, you have probably around 15 inventions that started off with federal funding, you know, GPS, microprocessors, lithium batteries, you name it. If you have kids like me who are young uh, and you give them baby formula, about 90% of all baby formulas have inventions, uh, ingredients that NASA developed initially and spun off into uh, commercial markets. So really, you know, where we live as a, an accelerator is uh, working with those early stage inventions, early stage companies that are all uh, in this area of what we call deep tech. So uh, usually B2B, usually uh, very technical founders. Um, we accelerate them forward in that very early stage. And I think the 
really differentiator for us that, that I'm proud of is, is just our scale. So we have about 55 research laboratories that we work with on spinoff programming. So NASA, Department of Defense, universities, uh, even some corporate partners now. And then we will work probably in the next year with uh, about 200 plus companies uh, that are all early, early stage hard tech. So um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Excited to go deeper. Um, <clears throat> thanks again for having us. Um, many thanks, Ben. And then uh, now I'd like for, for the last of our, our four speakers, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Garrett Winter, who's a partner at the Hacks Accelerator. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's, well, it's great to be on a panel with other uh, deep tech, hard tech science folks as well. So we, we, we don't always show the panels and have, have other folks work in that same way. Um, so quick thing about us, um, I'm a partner with SOSV and Hacks. So SOSV is a global venture capital firm um, and we're about just north of a billion dollars assets under management, um, invest in about anywhere between 75 and 100 new companies every year. And really what makes our, our thesis unique or how we operate a little bit different um, first is that we <clears throat> tend to be the very first investor. So we love to coming in being the very first institutional investor, usually about $250,000. Um, and we do that for about yeah 100 companies a year. And we love to go into areas that other investors typically shy away from. So deep tech, hard tech, life sciences, really anything where you go to a traditional, let's say Silicon Valley investor and say, hey, I have this new thing that lives in the physical world or requires a little bit deeper science uh, and they shy away from, that's where we actually usually run to. The, the second interesting thing about our model is that we, we take an accelerator or program approach. So when we make that first investment, um, we have facilities all over the world where we bring teams in-house uh, we have actually engineers on staff. We have a, a full team actually working with, with different startups and helping get through those very early stages of commercialization. So maybe you have a benchtop prototype or a robot that kind of is working as it should, but you're not quite sure what it does next. We Our goal is to really help you get to that, that next step of, of getting to maybe tens or hundreds or thousands of, of units and out into the world. And then the, the last unique thing about our, our investment is that we, we love to follow on. So we, we make that first investment and kind of that hands-on work that we do uh, via our programs is really our first step. So we love to then follow on about 75% of our capital is actually uh, distributed after our first check. So as teams grow and scale from seed to series A to series B. Uh, and then we do that through, so you'll see SOSV, but you also see other things like Hacks, um, which I help run, which is focused on hard tech. We also have other programs focused on indie bio, and those are just subdomains or sub brands uh, really focused on, on unique areas of deep, deep expertise. Uh, and, and why we're excited about, especially being here in the, the Princeton ecosystem is we're building up what will be kind of a new center of mass up in New York City or just outside of New York City between New York and Newark, New Jersey. So we have a new facility building up in Manhattan focused on life sciences, a new facility in Newark focused on hard tech. So machine shops and robotics testing, electronics and, and fabrication building up just outside of New York City. So excited to talk about that more um, and, and excited to, to dive deeper into the New Jersey and Princeton ecosystems. Great. Many, many thanks, Garrett. And, and thank you to all of our four, four panelists for, for joining us here today. Um, so for the rest of this session, the next half hour, we're going to have a have a Q and a and dig a little bit deeper into, into how these four accelerator programs operate and, and the accelerators more, more generally. Um, just to remind uh, everybody, um, if, if you are listening and you would like to ask your question, uh, please click on that Q&A box uh, in your session and, and type your questions in. And I'll, I'll do my best to, to integrate as many as possible uh, into the conversation today. Um, so, so I'm going to start with a simple one, and, and, and many of you sort of touched on this a little bit, um, but just wanted to get dig down into sort of eligibility. So um, so, so, what sort of startup companies in, in terms of stage and location and, and scope are, are going to be eligible and, and good fits for your accelerator? So if there's a, a, a budding entrepreneur in the audience, um, who, who, you know, uh, who would be the sort of type of startup, the say, uh, stage, location, uh, uh, scope um, that you would like to be hearing from right now? And, and Sharon, if I can ask you first. Thanks, Tony. Um, so the QED program is a program for academic based technologies. So we actually call them technologies. We don't call them companies at this stage. Uh, and because they are coming to us from uh, from the lab of, of uh, a researcher. Um, so what we look for is technologies with high commercial potential. So even though we're looking at technologies, what we're really looking for is the potential for that 
technology and, and the, the, the criteria to get into the QED program is very much contingent upon, is there a market for that technology? What's the market for that technology? Um, it, based on the science, but yet very much focused on the commercial aspects of that technology. So um, we convene a panel of um, it, mostly investors to help us make that decision about which technologies to accept into the program. Um, we have a lot of resubmissions to the program that will some they'll go through the program one year and they'll actually uh, go through it again the next year because they learn so much from the first year they go through it again. But the the selection of the uh, criteria to get into the program is really being part of the uh, 22 institutions that are um, that are part of our program. And from New Jersey, for example, we have Princeton, of course, who has just been a recent joiner to the QED program uh, at Rowan University, uh, NJIT, at Rutgers, um, and then from Delaware, Delaware State, and then from Pennsylvania, you have quite a few, uh, both institutions, uh, universities, and uh, research institutions, places like CHOP and WISTAR are also part of our uh, um, and other medical centers. So I should add that uh, what we're looking for are very high value medical um, device diagnostics or life science type technologies. So uh, what we also look at uh, dental technologies, um, even veterinarian technologies. Um, so it's, it's a very, very broad range. In fact, we want it to be as broad as possible rather than narrow as possible. So. That's what we look for. Many thanks, Sharon. Uh, Christina, can I ask, what do you, who are you looking for uh, to join eTeams? Sure, happy to. So we uh, embrace very early stage innovators and entrepreneurs, and we are also embracing you know, young innovators and entrepreneurs at the earliest stages. Um, so we, we work with students, both graduate and undergraduate, as they enter the first stage of our program. Um, we do look for innovations you know, like, like, like Sharon, based on substantial science and engineering challenges. We're a little bit broader. Um, it can be in healthcare, the environmental sciences, it can be solving any uh, major problem as long as the, the applicants make a good case for why this is an important problem to solve. We also really believe in the importance of backing the individuals. Um, so, and, and their journey, supporting their journey to become an entrepreneur or develop entrepreneurial mindset skills um, that they can take with them into their career, no matter where it ends up going. Um, so at the earliest stages, it's open to students at any uh, US higher education institution. We do look for teams. Um, so not just one person on their own. We look for teams. They should have a faculty advisor as well. Uh, and they're not incorporated either. They're usually incorporating over the course of our relationship with them over the, over the course of a couple of years. Now that said, we did create an additional on-ramp into our program at a later stage. So in our last stage of programming, we call it stage three or the Aspire program. It's all about investment readiness. So in order to increase equitable access into our programming, into our network of investors, if you're a startup that hasn't had a grant from VentureWell, you can apply directly into the Aspire program. Um, at that point, we are looking for the company to be incorporated, have spun out of the university, and has raised some non-dilutive grant funding, oftentimes in SBIR, um, and are getting ready to raise their first pre-seed or seed round. Um, so there's two different entry points in there, one more focused on students and one more focused on startups getting ready to raise seed rounds. Many thanks, Christina. Um, ben, I'm going to, just going to come around and ask the same question to everyone. But but um, who who should be reaching out to, to FedTech? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, um, really. You know, we we do a ton of programming with kind of seed and Series A stage companies. Often those that are, um, I think, like like others on this uh, panel. You know, uh, uh, working with technically based you know companies. A lot of times with companies that have received you know Phase One, Phase Two SBIRs. Um, one program that's a little different that I do want to highlight is really how we got our start, which is what we uh, call our startup studio, where you don't have to be even a company, you know, to participate. You can be a hungry, you know, uh, entrepreneur. What we do is take, uh, you know, great people and pair them up with actually inventions from our lab partners and spin off new companies. Really, I think at a, at a cool scale, we'll probably have 40 to 50 new ventures, you know, that are often, you know, they're seedlings. They don't all make it. But. Uh, 40 to 50 new ventures in the next year through that program. So if you're interested, if you're in this this uh, event and want to start a company, but don't maybe have that idea or that founding team, we can work with you. Um, and I'll just give you like one fun example that emerged from that program in the last year. So um, by some interesting consequence, we actually get a lot of like former 
NFL and NBA players applying to the program because they have money and they're often interested in, in, in the venture space. And um, one of the people that applied was actually the winner of Survivor Fiji, which I, I didn't even know there was a Survivor Fiji, but it sounds you know, impressive. And we paired the, uh, him up and some other teammates with a, a, a technology uh, that was actually going to go on Na uh, the Mars rover from NASA. And it's like a, a new way to formulate tires. And he spun off a company called Smart Tire and has since raised, you know, a good amount of money and is, is kind of off to the races. But what's fun about that program is our, you know, Survivor Fiji guy. I don't, I don't know if, if he ever would have found that on his own. Um, so we were really grateful to, to get to have him. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to meet you, too, if you're interested. Great. And many thanks, Ben. And Garrett, I won't come to you last every time, I promise. But uh, but but who, who would you like to be hearing from at, at Hacks and, and SOSB more generally? Well, more more Survivor finalists. <laughs> finalists. No. Um, so, we, uh, so what we love to do is invest right when teams are in that moment. I think similar to where, where Sharon Christina mentioned is that moment of transition from Hey, we have an idea or a white paper or or a kind of a, a set of people into a company so really that first moment of hey we sign our our formation papers we're kind of like taking that big step out we tend to be the 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 very first check that comes after that um and usually what we look for from a technology standpoint is and again this is just talking for hacks um indie bio and, and a few of our other programs have a different set of criteria but for, for hacks, we're focused on hard tech and robotics and, and things that live in the physical world. Um, we love to see that first prototype. So um, I say prototype, whenever I say prototype, a lot of times uh, people coming from an academic background or otherwise like, oh, we have to finish the first full product. When I say prototype, it's like literally you can take the technology from the lab bench and put it in a box you bought at Home Depot, as long as it has the intent towards commercialization and saying, how do we get this out in the world? How do we start formulating this to a new product? And that's where we love to jump in. So um, literally most teams walk in with prototypes that break every 10 minutes and that's totally fine. That's our goal of, of helping teams through that first step of, of commercialization. Um, and then we do have ways to like, like everybody else to engage earlier. So um, we have a few 10,000, we're writing about 30, $10,000 grants a year right now um, to companies that are probably in, in the science center right now or working in venture well, um, just to help uh, with that external force to say, hey, here's a little bit of money um and and a little bit of our expertise to help you guys take that next step so it's okay to come to us with an idea and hey i want to work on something cool and hey can you give me ten thousand dollars and we're happy to at least evaluate it great uh, thank you so much garrett so i've um, already had a couple of questions coming through in the q a um actually more about the applications process so we've talked about who should be applying to your accelerator programs i want to just dig in a little bit in, into the how um, Christina, and come to you first. Can I ask, you know, um, how should would someone sort of apply to venture LA teams, and, and what could they expect from the the applications process? Yeah, so there's three different deadlines a year to start out at stage one of the E team program. Uh, so it's in uh, January, May, or October. So we try to make sure that there's always an upcoming deadline. We ask for a five page proposal overviewing the technology innovation, the market potential, and we look for information about the team, the work plan and the support that the team has. We don't want lack of support to be a barrier. So we're more so looking about um, looking at how the team has been resourceful, like what resources are available and what have they been able to actually access in their community? Because we want to make sure that we're not um, you know, only favoring uh, universities that are very well resourced. We want to make sure that there are students coming from universities that maybe have, um, you know, fewer entrepreneurial ecosystem resources. So we've made efforts to try to level the playing field there. We also look for the teams to have letters of support. Um, the best letters of support are ones, you know, on one side, maybe speaking to the individuals, but on the other side, speaking to the opportunity more so and the validation of the problem and the technology. So um, the more you can get those customer validation type letters, um, the, the stronger the application tends to be. And we go through a, an external panel review process. So similar to what Sharon mentioned, we bring in a variety of technology experts, industry experts, and some investors to do a review um, of the proposals so we can make sure that we're looking at it very thoroughly. And we're always happy to provide that feedback to our applicants, uh, whether or not they're funded or rejected or invited to resubmit. Great. Um, many thanks, Christina. Um, Garrett, I'm going to come to you next. So how would someone go about applying to, to Hacks? Um, so we have an online application and we we invest, we will invest any day of the year. So kind of as soon as soon as soon as you're ready, you can put an application and we'll usually get back to you within a week or two on, on quick feedback on, 
hey, we're missing out this, or hey, this isn't a good fit, or hey, this is great, let's jump on a phone call. Um, and I think the, the best way to think about an application is um, highlighting your strengths and telling a good story. So oftentimes, um, a lot of teams get bogged down, like, I'm going to make this perfect application. I'm going to get my full, I'm going to go and find everything on Google around making great deal room. And you're, you're trying to do all the work of a Series A team. In reality, especially at pre-seed or kind of the very early stages, you want to highlight yourself as a founder or founders, uh, ideally. Um, how your product actually works and where do you want it to go, both in the short term of how to actually get this out in the world, but also in the long term, how does this actually have a big impact? And really telling that simple story is what gets us on the phone for the first time. You're not trying to sell us everything in that very first pitch deck. The whole goal is to get on the phone with us for the first time, and then we can have a conversation and dig in deeper. So I'd say that's the best way to apply is just really kind of uh, tell a good story and then kind of shape that into a pretty basic application. Many thanks, Garrett. Uh, Sharon, I'll come to you next. I know QED operates a little bit differently. Can you talk a little bit about the applications process for your program? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Yes, so every spring, it is a yearly program, and uh, every spring we work with the technology transfer offices and work through the technology transfer offices because the technologies that get accepted into our cohort have to be uh, sort of vetted by the, the tech transfer office, particularly because a lot of these technologies have extremely early IP, if any IP at all. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we work with the tech transfer office so that they feel that the technology has been uh, protected. Uh, we ask for a, a four-page non-confidential application, which focuses more on the market and uh, on things that we're going to actually be teaching them, yet we're, we're sort of asking them early on about the, sort of the market, um, what other com competitors look like, those kinds of things. It's it's more like an SBIR uh, application or the same kinds of questions that an SBIR uh, application would be looking at, um, but it's a it's a non confidential application. And again, then we do convene our uh, panel of uh, selection team panelists who are looking for that uh, that that potential that's there. And we recognize that we're asking researchers to fill out an application um, that is going to be asking them a lot about market questions. And uh, again, that's a, one of the reasons, too, why we go through the tech transfer office, because we hope that they'll give them a little bit of help on trying to make sure that that application is um, is looking at solving a problem rather than uh, highlighting the, the, the research that they have done. Uh, again, the research is always important, but you know, the, the sort of the market focus, this is a commercialization program. Uh, so so we do look for that um and uh yeah so we we then accept um up to 12 technologies that, that go into the cohort and then receive lots of uh business support once they're into the program uh and in um in defining that market in in looking at um the the regulatory pathway for these uh technologies if that's appropriate um so uh, that's our that's our process Many, many thanks, Sharon. And Ben, coming to you last, I actually have a sort of more specific question for you, which is coming from the audience. Um, so firstly, um, are, are your other FedTech Accelerator programs only available for uh, teams that come through your startup studio programs? Or do you have open programs for startups who are leveraging te technology developed on their own or at a university? Um, and then for all of those groups, how, how would they go about applying to FedTech? Yeah, definitely. Well, so I definitely encourage everybody to check out the website. I think our application process is probably less well thought out than, than my colleagues on, the, on this panel. It's just, you know, we have uh, web forms and then we really value um, sort of the use of just a, a video, you know, submissions where we get our, our teams really kind of talking and, and um, then interacting with our team kind of at a later stage. So, um, no, we definitely we have programs that are are open. A, a number of our biggest accelerators are actually working with uh, companies that are uh, funded with SBIR already, so so there is sometimes kind of like a, a stage gate where we you know we want you to be selected as a Cibber uh, uh, winning company, but um, you know we probably have about twelve to fifteen different things running, different programs running at any given time. Some of them are short, some of them are longer. Um, so just you know if you check our website, you can easily get kind of routed to the thing that's best for you. Great. Uh, so many thanks, Ben. So, um, so I'm just sort of digging into now more, I guess, in, into the, the journey that you'd expect sort of participants in your accelerator to take. So um, how would you expect, you know, a, a project or a startup, how different would they look um, coming out of the end of your accelerator program uh, to, to how they came in at the beginning? Uh, Garrett, would you like to, to talk about that first? Yeah, so I think the 
like I was mentioning, kind of we love to see early prototypes or kind of things that that likely won't ex work very well on the real world. And we love to get to that very first thing that that a customer can receive and use and be confident that they will pay you for for, for what you have. And that's really our goal over uh, our six month program. Um, and then the, the secondary goal is to get teams to uh, the next major round of funding within 12 months. So we want to, to help you not just say, here's the engineering, all the technical stuff is done. But uh, I work a lot with teams on business models, how do they get to their first customers, uh, and then our network investors that that know how to invest in this type of thing. So uh, I would say right about 90% of investors just don't touch deep tech. So you have to kind of like find the right people, tell the right story, and then also just focus on de-risking companies so that they actually look more like a software investment. So like, oh yeah, don't worry about the production. We have that all set up. Don't worry about the science. Oh yeah, here's being de-risked in this way. And all of a sudden when a, a seed or a series A investor looks at this thing and like, oh wow, I, I could do that. That sounds great. Um, and that's our goal is kind of really how do we shape the the scale and, and uh, risk of a company so that a seed or a series A investor will jump in pretty easily. Many, many thanks, Garrett. Uh, ben, I'll, I'll come to you next. Uh, what, what would uh, uh, you know um, a project look like coming out at the end of FedTech? What, what would you expect to get to? So, yeah, yeah, usually kind of three things: so market, network, and then kind of a definition of technical milestones. So, just just briefly on each one. So, for the market, you know, we, we came out of actually our um, the ICOR program, the NSF ICOR program. We FedTech was a spinoff and. Um, so we, we definitely have a huge focus on the customer discovery work, you know, that you go through in a typical i program. So that's a huge part of everything we do. Um, so uh, we also, you know, really big network of mentors, collaborators, pilot partners. We want our companies to have a, a, a bigger network than they entered with by, by quite a, an order of magnitude. And then lastly, um, because, you know, so much of our technology is, is really not close to being a finished product at all. Um, having a, a really good technical roadmap of what uh, they need to develop, who they need to be on their team to develop the, you know, the real product. Um, if we can have kind of those three categories um, in, in better shape than we found it, we're, we're really happy. Many thanks. So, Christina, can I ask, so what would you expect a, a company to like at the end of an E-Teams program compared, compared to the beginning? So, Yeah, so as they go through each of the, you know, individual workshops, they always come out with way more questions than they came in with. And we say, that's good. That means we did our job. Um, you know, we want to unlock what they don't know, they don't know, uh, and expand their their networks and their way of thinking, ways of thinking and really challenge their assumptions. But more specifically, you know, at the first stage, as I said, that oftentimes they're coming in uh, with three, one of three different mindsets. One is like the roadrunner where they know they want to be an entrepreneur and they're getting any resources that they can possibly get access to. And we're helping them along that already predetermined journey. Uh, another is more of a, an explorer. Like I'm here because I think I have some interesting technology, but I'm not sure exactly how to get that to market or if getting it to market is even what I want to do. I need more information before I take a risk to become uh, an entrepreneur. And then last is the seeker, someone who whose professor told them to come. And we love all of them. They can all uh, be successful. They can all get something out of the experience. Um, and we often see the seekers leveling up to the explorers and to the roadrunners um, throughout the journey. So uh, we just want them to move along um, to get more confident to be able to take that jump into incorporating, raising, raising funding, and eventually getting that product to market, assuming there is demand for it. Many thanks, Christina. And, and Sharon, sort of finally coming to you, what does a QED graduate look like compared to well, when it came in? Thanks, Tony. I, I think a, a lot of what my um, other presenters have also said is that, you know, they're you're, you're trying to give them confidence. I, I like that, Christina. That's a lot of what we're trying to do is we're working with researchers in labs. We recognize that. Um, when they come into the QED program, they're early stage. When they leave the program, they're early stage. So their their technology may not look a lot different, but um, but most of the graduates of our QED program say, I I I'm looking at the I'm looking at my technology differently. I'm looking I'm I'm better able to apply for grants. I'm better able to talk about what I'm doing because now I talk about my technology in terms of the need in the market rather than I talk about what problem I'm solving with my technology, which is which is what they didn't understand before that they really need to talk about what 
what problem they're solving rather than what what are they what did they build and how does that you know who might want that so they're building a proof of concept plan during the qed program which is a really valuable roadmap for them to say in the next three to five years what must i do in a technical sense to prove out this technology so that it will be attractive to investors and how it will move on in the commercialization pipeline uh what what is the what is the road look like for uh regulatory and even though i'm i'm not there these are the things i need to do in order to get to where i need to, to be in that in that uh, and sometimes it's a lot of the wrong roads that they were thinking that they that it, in their mind that they needed to go down is is kind of uh, discussed and with the help of their business advisors they understand that um you know they can't go they all they all kind of come to us saying oh i've got this platform technology can be used in every in you know three thousand markets and each of them are a billion dollars so uh, you know <laughs> so their initial uh, sort of pitch is you know this is going to be uh everybody's going to want this and it's going to be useful and they've proven it in in no market have they, they, they have, they've got no actual data in any one specific area so you know it's a it's a real learning curve for them to understand how they have to uh start you know in a in and get it get uh get proof of concept it's a proof of concept pr pr program uh in a, in a certain market and be able to talk about what is that tr that pathway for them to move forward Many thanks for everyone. So, and, and thank you also to the audience for, for so many questions you're throwing at me. I'm going to try and get through as many as I can in the, in the next five minutes as maybe a sort of a bit of a lightning round. But um, I, I guess the first question we've seen quite a lot is the accelerator space is, you know, is, is fairly busy and getting a little bit more crowded. How does a budding entrepreneur decide which accelerator program to join, especially when there's sort of other national programs out there, your sort of wine combinators and textiles programs uh, that are also in some ways competing with you? Um, how, if I'm a budding entrepreneur, did I decide which accelerator is right for me? Uh, ben, would you like to go first on that? Yeah, really good question. I think, um, you know, just looking at what you're trying to achieve as a startup, you know, what, what that accelerator is going to do for you i think there's there's you know uh different benefits to, to a uh, bunch of different types of programs depending on kind of where you are and what your stage is the one thing i would kind of caution is um we do see kind of a number of ventures that, that will just sort of bounce from program to program and I, I i you know would always just be cautious of you know you're kind of um giving away you know a, a lot for potentially a, a little bit of investment if you're doing that and like if you, you probably yeah, I just want to be have a critical eye if you're going through more than one one or two of them uh but uh there's a lot of wonderful programs out there and, and just having a very clear kind of understanding i think of the intent of what you want to achieve and and how they're going to get you there uh is what i would recommend would anyone else like to chime in on the issue um yeah i mean we we talk about this a lot um I think the the one thing I would evaluate, and I, I, I've actually I've had my own startups, I've gone through other accelerators, been in the exact shoes that a lot of our our startups have been in, and I think really the well the first filter is just like look at before and after pictures, right? Like kind of look at where did the team start and where did they get to, right? And kind of go and search out alumni and just see what is that start and end state, and if that's kind of the journey that you want to go on. And I think the other thing too is just looking for really tangible value, right? Kind of the a startup accelerator won't make you a startup. If you're like questioning, mm -hmm. like, oh, how do I have a business model and how do I get a pitch deck? And like, those are all things that just like happen as you build a company, mm -hmm. but you you don't want to look for something that's like, oh yeah, this is going to mint me as a startup. Um, and and really looking at that tangible value, like that hands-on value, networks, uh, hard assets, uh, infrastructure, kind of what what am I getting and what is the the journey I go on based on being a part of this. And then I think the easiest way to look at it is the, the before and the after pictures of, of startups that have done it. Right. Uh, many thanks. Um, so another question is coming. I'm probably going to direct this one at you, Christina, first of all, because you sort of touched on it. But a lot of what's been discussed is um, uh, sort of accelerated programs and actually a lot of the conference as a whole uh, is sort of focused on on geographic areas near major universities near big cities um there's also a significant need to support in in sort of rural and, and sort of more underserved communities um are, are there programs that are working in those areas as well yeah i think uh lots of states are more and more frequently offering uh programs designed you mean r rural innovation correct that's what you're asking yeah about. i mean so, yeah. so that, that that's this is a question coming in from the audience but yeah, yeah, yeah. So at least mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've I've come across a lot a lot of locally funded economic development uh, programs. Um, however, there are also a lot of virtual programs now too at the national level. So we work with students from every state in the country. You know, we've had students um, recently from North Dakota State University, Oklahoma State. You know, any of any different. Um, all the diff all 50 states are represented in their programming. So uh, my recommendation to innovators and entrepreneurs in rural areas would be like, look at what the state is offering in terms of economic development support and see what virtual programs are, are open to you. We've also been experimenting with some stipend programs to be able to um, fund the travel costs if a student does need to travel um, for the workshop or for the training event to be able to support that to improve um, equitable access to the program because we recognize that not everyone's living in the cities and in the coast and we want to be able to support job creation and economic development in, even in rural areas. Great. So, so many thanks. I'm just going to try and fit one more question from you from the audience. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, sort of hard tech uh, and deep tech businesses. Um, are there any accelerators out there for uh, for companies in the sort of humanities, social sciences and fine arts? Um, and, and I guess a sort of related question, uh, are there any programs that sort of emphasize um, human centered design thinking, um, you know, uh, that are out there? And if anyone would like to chime in on that? Well, uh, yeah, I know there's I think the, the good thing about accelerators is that there's there's one for everybody now. Um, and that, that's part of it. Like, go find that niche and find somebody that's going to add a lot of value. Um, and I think the, well, to the human-centered design question, the good thing is that a lot of the these accelerators have have people that have worked in that space. So our, our actually hacks, it has three former IDEO folks, including myself, just that's our that's our world. So um, all for it. But I think you want to find people who have human-centered design inter integrated into technology and integrated into these other things. Um, I think the good thing is that uh, there's there's literally a program for everybody now, which is great. And a lot of the generalist programs right now are, are struggling because like, oh wait, we need to somehow figure out a way to do this this really niche or nuanced thing that that can't just be solved with the the general startup playbook, um, which is great because everybody on this this call has experience and, and depth in doing beyond just the the Silicon Valley normal make a pitch deck, go make a, a back end SaaS software. Thank you so much. And, and um, I, I'm afraid we've run out of time, which is a shame because I could talk about this for for the, for the next several hours with you all. But but I just wanted to 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 thank you all, Sharon, Christina, Ben, and Garrett, for a really illuminating conversation. Thank you all for for joining us here at Engage uh, 2021. And uh, we look forward to sending many more uh, startup companies uh, your way in, in the years to come. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys.